brother, or should I say, howdy yokes, my name's Jay and I am today's special guest, I am Tyler's older brother from the Super Carlin Brothers, and before we get started today, we just wanted to let you know that this episode of Bacon and Eggs is brought to you by you! The guys here at Bacon and Eggs, Tyler and Ethan, want to build it as big as it can be. More episodes, merchandise, events, giveaways, you name it, they will put their logo on it and sell it. You say scorpions, there will be scorpions with bacon and eggs on it. Maybe they'll even eat them or put them down their shirts or something. I don't know. You name it, they'll do it. But we can't do it alone. If you enjoyed this episode or any of the episodes here on Bacon and Eggs, head over to their Patreon page at patreon.com slash bacon and eggs. And can Consider checking out some of the great reward tiers they've set up over there, or making a donation of any kind. They want to keep this podcast free and available for everyone, so if you have a couple of bucks to spare, anything goes a long way, and they can really use your help to make this podcast the best it can possibly be. So, thanks for donating, and thank you even more for listening. And remember, Scorpions. Howdy, Yokes, and welcome back to Bacon and Eggs. I'm Tyler Carlin. And I'm Ethan Edgehill. And we're coming to you from the not too distant future. In a virtual reality utopia. So get your DeLorean ready. And power up your Iron Giant. Because we're not going quite 30 years in the future. Maybe 30. Is it 30 years? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Because we've got a special guest today for Ready Player One. Hey yeah, guys. So What's up, T? Today we're, we're, oh, not much. Just, you know, got out of the movie theater about 20 minutes ago. And now I'm here talking to you. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, wow. so you've seen the, so have you seen the movie twice? I've seen the movie twice. I saw it day of... 7 p.m. Nice. I know, later. I don't know. And then I saw it today at 4 o'clock. You saw it at 8.15 uh, p.m. I did? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Because I went and I got Because I saw it at 8 p.m. Anyway, it was released March 29th, 2018, and that was just four days ago, on a $175 million budget budget, apparently. Ethan, has it already made that money back? It has. It made $182 million worldwide in the opening weekend. That is exactly twice as much as I predicted for this movie. Uh, So that's good. A lot of well it was done, foreign. Like, one. almost all of it was foreign. Well, if you can get your movie into some of those foreign boxes, box offices like especially japan that's how you know it's gonna make money yeah it made like they, 42 in the u.s they japan not japan i'm sorry china being at your movie in china that's where the money's at and china only picks so many movies like very few movies are profitable because of you know they cost 175 million dollars and if you don't have some huge box office opening weekend from your huge blockbuster uh most movies don't make any money hey you but, know you know you don't it doesn't have to cost that much do you know how much do you know what the budget was for the lion king it was i do not it is it was 45 million and they made like 987 million yeah but today Boom. if you want robert downey jr to be in your movie it costs 50 million they right had there. elton john man yeah yeah, but he's not Robert Downey Jr. in 2018. <laughs> yeah, but he was Elton John in 1994, so I don't know. They also, yeah, and they also had Darth Vader, who was... <laughs> yeah, and, the, and they had Darth Vader. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I'm talking about The Lion King all of a sudden. I was just looking at all the numbers last week for a video we did over on SCB, so they're fresh on my mind. Yeah, well, and, and there's other movies, like World of Warcraft. Do you remember that one? Uh, absolutely not. Well, it was pretty terrible. It didn't do super well in the United States, but it ended up being one of, like, the most profitable movies of that year because it went absolutely bonkers in china Wait, it was mm. only like three there was a world of ago. warcraft movie yeah, i think it's called warcraft or world of warcraft i don't know it was about orcs or something i didn't see it so it but terrible. tyler it sounded like you didn't think this movie was going to do very well i did not i thought that it was going to be a little like as i was looking at the numbers for pacific rim and stuff like that and i thought it was going to do a little bit better than that but not quite you know one of these major like marvel or harry potter type blockbusters so it, and it did it still didn't quite make that it came but i thought out on it was going to do thursday about mm -hmm. which is kind of weird like i went and saw it on wednesday and i went and saw it with an almost empty theater on wednesday hmm. same both times i've seen it it's been pretty much empty hmm. i don't know is it is like being off work on the friday before easter a thing could they have been yeah, like moving the day back a lot of people were off yeah okay that that could have been their thinking yeah i, I think that was probably something to do with I, I at the end of the day i don't know why they did it but like a lot of people had no idea it came out wednesday and i think that was probably why but when i saw it on wednesday yeah it was pretty much empty hmm. so i was scared at first um but seeing that figure is is changed things uh anyway it's got right now a 76 percent critic score on rotten tomatoes and it was as high at one point as 81 82 and it's an 80 percent uh, audience score on rotten tomatoes so it's done okay and so far it's not doing super Super hot on Metacritic with a 64. That falls on about par with some of the mid-range Marvel movies we've reviewed, and I think that is pretty comfortable for me with how it sits. Um, but we'll get to that later. Ethan, do you have a negative review for us? <coughs> I do have a negative review. Michelle Alexandria of the Eclipse Magazine says this movie is basically a live-action Wreck-It 
Ralph, except horrible. If there was ever a generic movie to be made about Warcraft and MMOs like that, this movie would be the result. I can't say I was disappointed with this movie. It gave me exactly what I expected. Visual eye candy without a soul. I left the theater thinking I didn't regret the two plus hours I spent watching it, but I would have rather been doing something else. Brutal. So funny that she talked about Warcraft. I I, I did not. That's know why that you I was so surprised when you mentioned I Warcraft like, the movie. Yeah, I thought that seems like a harsh review to me. And I bet she didn't read the book. <laughs> oh, for sure she didn't read the book. Yeah. Actually, the first uh, line of that review was, I didn't read the book, so if that's going to bother you, stop reading. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it bothered me. <laughs> well, uh, I actually have a positive review from a place I did not expect to find it. Uh, this is from the Christian Science Monitor. This is Peter Rayner. Uh, he's a top critic on... Rotten Tomatoes, I guess a lot of people like to know what they have to say about things. Uh, but he says, with VR technology already upon us, Ready Player One postulates a universe a lot closer to our lives than in those films. Uh, and yet, it's noticeably deficient in bad vibes. I think the reason is that the movie is at odds with itself. Spielberg wants us to drop the techno gadgets and join hands, but it's the VR world that really juices him. He's the ultimate fanboy making a movie about the need to move beyond being a fan. B minus. So, it's not like a super positive review, and what it's referencing there at the beginning is, it's a, these are are all super long reviews that we usually just condense down into just a little bite-sized piece for you. Um, he's talking about all of the references in the movie and how, like, this is now closer to our reality than going to the movies would have been in, like, 1985 and seeing Back to the Future. Uh, which was, there was a lot of Back to the Future, and I'm all about that. So that was a <laughs> I mean, he drives around Spielberg. in, like, the DeLorean for the most of the movie, so. And he's got a Zemeckis cube. Yeah. Yeah, which takes oh. you back in time. Yeah. That was clever. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was clever. I wonder, are Z are these friends, Zemeckis and Spielberg? Didn't they direct Back to the Future together? Is that, was that it? I think you're right. Or you're Spielberg correct. produced it, or? They were, he was involved. Was he involved? I don't know. I thought it was Zemeckis and a uh, different guy. I don't know. I feel like Spielberg was involved. Because there was some controversy where Spielberg was like, I'm not going to remove everything from my movies. I'm going to leave the DeLorean. Well, you can't not have And the T-Rex. Yeah. Yeah, and the T-Rex. Jurassic Park, man. Did he do Kong as well? Was he any, at any point part of that? I have no idea. I don't think so. No. Well, okay, so one can dream. just let's let's get the elephant out of the room real quick, okay? Uh, Jonathan, the reason that we asked you to be on... Are you talking about, Ethan, are you talking about dressing an elephant? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about dressing and putting makeup on an elephant. Not oh, man. yet. We'll Look, get if you there. if you want to dress an elephant, that's how you solve a family dispute, okay? Right. But that's right. a that's a whole that's a whole different thing from Super Carlin Gaming. Gotcha. Okay. Anyway, Jonathan, we asked you to be on this episode because uh, you were the person that told us both to read this book originally. Great. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. And it's become b one of our favorite books combined as a unit. And oh. and uh, personally, at least mine, at least I think Tyler does as well. He reads it every yeah. week, single year. Yeah, it's it's one of the few books that for a long time, I don't know how, but my Audible, like for a long time I was reading nonfiction on Audible. So like the only reliable fiction that I could listen to was Ready Player One. And I would just go back to it and listen to it over and over again when I wasn't doing stuff for like my professional job. And <laughs> I love it. It's so good. The audiobook is phenomenal. Will Wheaton does a great job of bringing these characters to life. But yeah. I want to I go ahead and, and get everything out of the way about the book now, because what I don't want to do is just sit here and go, well, it wasn't as good as the book for the next however long we record this. <laughs> can, I tell you, can I tell you something real quick? Yeah. It wasn't as good as the book. It wasn't as good as the book. There we go. <laughs> I can tell Elephant you that right out now. Out of the room. <laughs> okay, I, I would. T I mean, I'm gonna. I mean, it wasn't as good as the book, but I think it. That's completely okay because it wasn't trying to be the book either, which I think is no. the the movie saving grace. Um, yeah, more or less. Like, I think. Yeah, go ahead. I think basically what happened was on the first day, Steve Spielberg sat down. He was like, "Man, that's a good book. That's a real good book. We're not gonna do that. I know what's gonna happen if we try to do that." We're not going to do that. <laughs> well, right. even when the very first time I read this, and by read, I mean listened to it. Um, actually, I own two copies of the book, hard copies, that I have not read either of them. Yeah, I've never actually read this book with my eyes. Only yeah, with my I have, eyes. Uh, I I've only listened to it. Although, I, I do mean to read it with my eyes at some point, because, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but there is a uh, an Easter egg contest within the book. Did you know that? I was Ooh. aware of that, and if you got it, you won something, right? That was a, like a... So, yeah, I think, uh, and I can't confirm it, but I think uh, in in the book, Ready Player One, the way you got the clue to the copper key was um, by reading Anorak's Almanac, and, like, certain letters were notched, and if you put them all in a row, it gave you the, like, uh, the clue to get to the first 
the first key. Right. And within Ready Player One, I believe there's a bunch of notched letters, and if you spell it out, it was something to the effect of the first person who sets a new high score on an 80s, like, classic arcade game will, like, win a DeLorean. Or yeah, you won a DeLorean. Yeah. It was completed so, someone on has August done it. 9th. The contest is over, but I thought that was so cool that he's, like, done this book about Easter eggs, and there's an Easter egg contest in his book. I was like, ah, oh, Ernest Klein, you sly dog. That's amazing. Yeah, so it, it was a similar, like, multi-part contest, and it was won on August 9, 2012 by Craig Queen, who had to, you had to set a record on, like, you had a list of our Atari 2600 games, and he set a world record in Joust and won the DeLorean. Man, impressive. Impressive. Yep. Well done, sir. Do you know what game is impossible? Joust. 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 Have you ever tried to play Joust? Oh, uh, you know what game's really impossible is Donkey Kong. Oh yes. Gosh. It's King so Kong. hard. Man. None of the games oh, we play God. these days prepare us for how hard old video games were. Yeah, no, no, not at all, not at all. I remember played... playing Donkey oh, Kong 64, and one of the, like, golden bananas you have to collect is by, I think you just have to beat, maybe it's just the first level of Donkey Kong, and I think it took me, I think it was the hardest banana in the whole game. Like, oh my gosh. Anyway, I remember that, but, uh, well, I've yeah, playing a... Super Mario Odyssey, and there's a old Donkey Kong-themed level. I don't know if you guys have played that at all, but... I haven't quite gotten there yet, I just recently got that game, actually. Oh man, it's super fun, it's super fun. It is super fun. Yeah, I'm oh. enjoying it a lot right now. But yeah, so um, back to back to Ready Player One. That's what we're here to talk about and book the to, for the book versus movie. So I my even when I was first reading the book, um, I was like concerned because like it was so obvious to me that it was going to be a movie because it was just so engaging, and I like I was so immediately busy. concerned that. There's so many different properties that are mentioned and referenced in this. Like, there's no way they're going to get the licensing to do everything the way it is in the book. And Oh, it would have cost a billion dollars. It would have cost a billion dollars. They'd still be working out the the all the contracts and there'd be just so much litigation and all that i just i, I mentally prepared myself the first time i read it like it there's no chance it's like the book so what i thought they would do was pretty much adapt it but sort of replace like i think they'd do like the war game simulation in the book so i figured oh well they won't get the rights to war game so they'll just replace it with something that i don't know who produced this was it universal I think this is Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers. Okay, I figured they would just sub out everything for stuff that fit the theme under Warner Brothers. And uh, I think I like what they did instead. They didn't try and really do that at all. They just sort of watered it down a lot. They kept the essence of the book there, but I think it would have been I think it would have been visually boring to watch some of the challenges that happened in the book. Like, you know, it's yeah, not going to be You don't want to watch him sit there and play Pac-Man for 6 hours. Yeah, I it was like how Granted, do you edit someone playing Pac-Man to be Really interesting. Except, You're playing Joust. I mean, right, but that's Jonathan coming from somebody, you know, you, Jonathan, who I have probably logged six hours of you playing a game from the early 90s, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, sure. Uh, a little different, but, you right, know, that's not a movie doing commentary and talking over it, not just sitting there, like, silently pressing buttons in this right. manic attempt to get the top score ever. Right. It's like, you're not actually trying to be the very best like no one ever was. <laughs> not not on succeed. my playthroughs, no. I think there are probably people who are, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not into the competitive Pokemon battling scene, as it were, at the moment. Before we keep going, I just want to say, for all those out there who have not seen this movie yet, this, this podcast is going to contain spoilers. Oh, uh, totally. Like, it, I know you know that by now at this point, listeners, but if you don't, there are going to be spoilers, so if you don't want to listen to spoilers about the movie and or the book, turn it off. We, we have a lot of other episodes. Yeah, there's a bunch of episodes. Go see the movie. <laughs> it's palatable. And if you're a first-time listener, welcome. welcome. Spoilers. <laughs> spoilers. Continue. Um, okay. Yeah, so I... I think the biggest adjustment they made from the book and what I think people are I think what people would be upset with about it not being like the book is that if what you liked about the book was all of the 80s pop culture references then you're you are not time. going to like the movie because they just drop all of, almost all of that entirely I thought. Well, I I think and if you go back and read the book, I don't know if you have this experience, but if you read it, it sounds like the people who are gunters are small in number by the time the copper key is found in the book, right? So it's tough to visualize because you're getting all of these very clear details about all these amazing 80s references. It's tough to visualize how many people don't care about the 80s anymore and would be showing up as the Master Chief, as Overwatch characters. Right, yeah. As, you know, and that's, you got to remember that that's all happening while they're finding the keys. Yeah. You know, because it... The, the general populace is at this point disinterested in the contest, thinking that it can't be done. And then, of course, when the copper key is found, everybody's interested again. But all of that Overwatch and Halo and well, all that stuff. I was under the impression, and I think it even there. says this in the book, that like Wade straight up says the whole world 
became re-obsessed with the 80s. He he does say that they became re-obsessed with the 80s, but then after like five years in the contest, no one's found the copper key that the contest sort of dies down again. I, just, and- I got the impression from that that the 80s craze didn't die down, though. That was just like another part of culture now well i think it was that's why you know you go in to the auction and there's the zemeckis cube and why you know some people drive deloreans yeah. and even like i think it's still there but i think after five years you start seeing a lot more of that you know when when culture is whatever you want to create it to be i think you're going to see references from all major pop culture decades right and decades. the the in the book the oasis doesn't launch with the contest you know the oasis exists for a long time before halliday dies so the 80s thing wouldn't have happened until then anyway so yeah I always thought it was weird in the book that they're not mentioning other big video games. Like, you know, like what they have all these giant robots and stuff. Like, where where's all the Power Ranger people? Where's all the where's all the Pokemon? You know, like there there's absolutely in the Oasis an entire world dedicated to Pokemon. Well, you know, the first thing you see of the Oasis in the movie is Minecraft. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a super questionable choice. I did not. No, I was like, no, thank no. You I, for Minecraft. Yeah, I, I, th- I thought it was fine. It was fine with me. But no, it just like that was the least like fantasy world looking part of it. Yeah, true, true. Was the yeah, first thing I you mean, see is this like really low res Minecraft world. Right. Sure. Sure. That makes. Um, I see what you're saying. But yeah. So on some level, this is both the best and worst film adaptation of a book pretty much ever because on one hand if you're looking for a straight adaptation of the book in that like it ticks off all the same boxes as the book you're gonna have be miserable you're gonna have a bad time like it does it's not the same story right it, on the other on the other hand it does a good enough job of separating itself from the book that it can be enjoyable i think it serves well as a love letter to the book right it's it's telling the book like hey thank you for setting all this up for me i couldn't possibly do what you did in two hours and 20 minutes but I love that you exist, and I'm just going to take a lot of things and switch them around, maybe change some character motivations, but all in all, it's like, you know, it's Sorrento and Wade and Artemis and sort of Daito and Shoto. They're, you know, they're there, kind of. Yeah, how, so, yeah, let's talk about the characters. How did you, uh, how did, how did you feel about the high five? So, uh, the fact that you I'll mentioned you the high first, five, Steve. um, it stems a big issue I actually have with the movie as a movie. In that, like, there's a lot of stuff that's not adequately explained and almost felt like it got edited out. The first time they ever say high five is in the final battle. And oh, is that sudden, right? Man, I guess... All of a sudden, <laughs> it's a big deal. They're like, oh my god, you guys are the high five. And Par- You're Artemis. He's like, I'm Parzival of the high five. And I'm, and I'm like, you've never said that before. <laughs> and all, all I can imagine is that it was brought up in some scene that got left on a virtual editing room. Sure. Oh, there's there's a lot of stuff in this movie that, like... I remember watching it the first time being around and being like, I need to fill in the blanks for myself yeah. all I, while this is going All on. I can imagine is they made a movie that was, like, seven hours long and just kind of said, what what do we do? And somebody was like, just cut out all the slow parts. All of and them. Then, all of them. Not... Don't just cut out all the slow parts, but also add a lot of exposition at the beginning so we can kind of speed along. Yeah, just give me give me ten minutes of straight voiceover exposition, uh, while yeah. while Parzival walks very slowly across like a mall. Well, so, yeah, it was interesting how they had to do the world building in the movie, right? Because like maybe fifty percent of the book is Wade literally telling you about the world around him and like obviously you can't do that you just have you just have to see it but they need to establish it really quick right up front so you know what you're dealing with so i didn't i didn't totally mind the narration but it probably could have been done a little uh more show don't tell but well yeah no for sure i mean the book starts with it's probably if you listen to the audiobook it's probably half an hour of anorak's invitation and wade's rambling about god being dead (laughs) oh my god the whole (laughs) uh wade being an atheist is so funny in the book because i think tyler you you put it very succinctly to me one day and it's like oh yeah he opens about being an atheist and then uh goes and becomes god after dying and coming back he, to life he dies <laughs> it was like dies oh, yeah. again and becomes god to save the world from itself like right <laughs> you don't get a more clear you know christian symbolism there right than... it's it's very much the hero's journey he goes yeah. on yeah. but uh yeah it's fine it's fine um but no i i had no problem with the exposition at the beginning of the movie uh it was it was the way that it had to be and i actually really liked the fact that the first challenge they got into it so quickly and the first challenge was just so different from anything i was expecting anything that happened in the book that i was able to sit back and just kind of go okay fine let me see what <laughs> we're just not gonna do it the way i thought let me see what okay. you got I agree with what I I totally had that exact same feeling, Ethan. Like I think I feel like that was strategic on their part. They're like, okay, we are gonna hit them right in the right between the eyes in the first five minutes, 
And anyone who thinks this is going to be like the book can accept it right up front so they're not disappointed later. And that was, I was like, okay. Like, as soon as I started doing this race, I'm like, oh, they're not even trying. Okay, never mind. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm abandoning all pretense that this is like the book. Um, well, and, and what you got to realize is there are people out there, I didn't know this, I saw it on the on your Discord the other day, Jonathan, where somebody was like, I'm really excited about the movie, I have about half of the book memorized. It's like, oh man, you're, you're going to have a bad time. I can tell you right now, you're going to have, you're not going to see holes. This isn't an 80 page book. This is, there's a lot of stuff in there. A lot of rights. You got to realize. <laughs> holes is great. Holes is so good. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Um, Stanley Yelnats. But no, the so, first, the first 10 minutes of the movie, I was sitting there like, I mean, kind of, it's kind of <laughs> what happens. Yeah. And I'm then not, the so, race started, the race started. I'm like, all right, fine. But go, go for it. Let's see what you got here. Let's see okay, what you got. That being said, the race, race is, and the race is entertaining, you know? It, you get to learn a little bit about the world. Um, I, but I, what I didn't what I didn't end up liking as much about the way they did things was that, like, he even... He just voices it over that someone else figured out the first clue and it was this race, but so far no one's won. And I was like, you didn't even figure out the first clue? Like, Yeah, that it was gives, interesting. It really takes a lot of, like, the credit away from Wade as, like, a deep-dive gunter... Who knows literally everything? Wade doesn't figure anything out in this movie. Well, he he figures out the um the doesn't he get to the shining thing right? Or he figures no. out to drive backwards. He figures out to drive backwards because something Artemis told him. No, he's you know James Halliday like says it right, but she she said the thing about I don't want to make any more rules, I'll, and that's how he figured out the thing about where Halliday weirdly stared off into the camera and was just like I want to go backwards really fast. Oh, that was yeah, so was that was so stupid. He says like. Because it, they, they 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 stayed on that scene for like a beat too long. Yeah. Like all they needed to do was have him say like, sometimes I just wish you could go backwards. Cut. And it was like, sometimes I wish I could go backwards. And then he like looks at Wade really, really fast backwards. I think you should drive in reverse through a secret passage. You know? <laughs> It's like, what? God, make it more... Ugh, that was annoying. I that thought. was a cool scene, though, where it was like uh, vector graphics and you see the whole inside of the, the race, like, building itself. Yeah. And Wade's driving through all of it. That was sick. That, that was super cool. It was cool. I will say, to Ethan, to your point, uh, uh -huh. moving on, you know, Wade doesn't figure anything out in this movie. Wade's not the hero in this movie. He's I don't barely feel like. the main like, character. Yeah, we were listening. I was uh, talking to John Negroni about this, and he was like, why is Artemis not the main character in this movie? Right, like she's clearly the more interesting one. She also would have been at the race more frequently if she was the legendary Gunter Artemis. She that would have not been, have been the first every time. race. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't have been the first time they ran into her. But whatever, I'm not gonna get caught up on nitpicky details like that. But she was like clearly more interesting, already part of like a major rebellion. Was the one that like you know went and did the whole yeah, way. She thing took from the, the sacrifice. Book. Right. And, oh, like, oh. You know, let me tell. Okay, we're gonna. Okay, I have thoughts about Artemis. I'm gonna have to interject here. Go nuts. Sorry. Go nuts. Okay, I agree with you, first of all. Like, they sort of introduce her as if she's some famous gunter that no one, you know, everyone knows about, but no one's seen. Oh, the six of fixer? Yeah, the six of fixer. Um, yeah. <laughs> I thought H was great, by the way. But uh, I think the exact we can go back to opposite. H. I thought H was terrible. No. No. No, H couldn't act at all. No. H was like, that thing's scanning our van. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> Art, yeah, I agree. They would have they would have encountered Artemis way before that because she's not just gonna roll in there on the first try and be awesome at this race, uh, right? Without having practiced it before. Uh, so. I don't know. It felt like it was her first race though because she didn't know about Kong. True, she did not know about Kong. Well, then, well, then I dis then I disagree that she would have been that that she would have gotten a Kong. You know, that's what I'm saying. Is I guess they're just trying to play her off as this like incredible. She's just good at everything. Right. So well, and and they they build that up again when they're in the the dance floor and like. Wade is just way outmatched when the Sixers show up. Like, he doesn't have any weapons. He's not knocking anything out. He's still distracted by Artemis. And Artemis is like, you need to... I've got this assault rifle from Halo. We got to fight. We got... This is not the time, Wade. Stop telling he had, he has the Zemeckis the cube at that point, and he uses it late. But anyway, so one of the problems I think they encounter with Artemis is that... They try, they have to create the, like, the gap between their relationship. Like, they can't just have them be happy right out of the gate because, you know, movies. And so they have this whole, like, I want to meet you in real life. I love you. And she's like, no, you can't. You, you, I'm nothing like this in real life. You wouldn't want to see me. And it's like, it's so annoying because it's like, it's not like she's some recluse like she is in the book. It's not like she's, you know... Like, it's not like she's extremely distrustful of anyone like she is in the book. It's like, you 
are apparently the leader of some rebellion or something? Like, tons of people see you. You are in the same city. There is... I, there's no reason for you to not like it's stupid that she doesn't want to meet him face to face when they're so close by I didn't like that um I don't I don't like is, they they make her much more trusting in here she's extremely helpful you know like I guess they're uh, I have some more thoughts about the clanning stuff but the the moment when she shoves Wade through the thing she's like you'll thank me for this later the Oasis I thought that was you. the dumbest scene in the whole movie. There is no reason for her to get captured. Like that does not stop. Like she could have gone through with like you know. It's like it's like uh it's like uh it's like Jack and Rose. You know what? They both could have fit through that hole and in time. Well, she. I think what you don't catch, and this is sort of a book thing, is she has. I'm under the impression that she has all the codes and all that stuff, and she's planning to do what Wade was gonna do in the book when she gets into IOI. Like I think she gets caught on purpose because she sends that text to everybody before she gets caught she sends it to h to come pick up yeah, wait come pick up wait is that all it that's was? all it to was me, it she doesn't like... know at all what's going on when she gets to the loyalty center or right whatever. yeah she's clearly there's doesn't some have a plan which there's by the way easiest thing on. to escape from ever it was like how has no one figured this out it's just a switch from the inside because well, you can't see anything you can't see anything you have an oasis what helmet locked to your face but still later on she's able to see sorrento from an oasis helmet but what gets me with with the whole artemis and wade thing is it happens too quick and then she she says after the Zemeckis cube, you don't get it, Wade, you don't get it, blah, blah, blah. Kicks him down. They don't have any communication. The next scene is the stacks blowing up. The following scene is her grabbing Wade and being like, hey, we're on the same team now. We're, this is it. Literally the last time she was on screen, she was saying, you don't get it, Wade. I'm doing this for, you know. I, you don't live I, in the I, real I world. Cannot take, right, you don't live in the real world. IOI cannot take over. You don't understand the gravity of this. You're just going to slow me down. Yeah. And then the next scene that they're together, she's like, we're a team now, yeah. buck, buckaroo. It's, it's very buck plot convenient. Buddy. And it's yeah. also annoying that, like, she seems to be the leader of some sort of rebellion. But, like, in what are they rebelling against like are yeah, that whole camp like, just there to support her playing the game maybe you know like they don't do any they don't do anything her little camp well and, and she even said earlier on that she's not any sort of in any sort of Gunter clan, like she wouldn't share her winnings with anyone else. Yeah, um, I really m maybe my least favorite line in the whole movie was at the very. I think it's the last thing Wade says where he goes, this, "I'm splitting it with my clan." Like he find like they each keep saying, "Oh, we don't no, no we're all solos," you know. Like that well, that's I think I think you're clogging your brain with the book there because I think only Wade says it once and Artemis might say it once in the movie. Otherwise, it seems like Daito and Sho in the movie are all in on this teamwork thing. Our first scene with H is like going through a quest with Daito and Sho, and then they're like, first the egg, first to the first to the key, first to the egg is what they keep saying. Well, right. he just happens I, I, to be in the same place as Daito and Sho in the movie. I don't think he's there like with them. I think there's just yeah, well, like a not mutual respect. Them. Right. He does save like, them. Like he could have very easily Yeah, he saves them. He busts out his like sniper rifle or whatever and he kills the guys that are fighting them. Yeah. And it seems like other people are just PvPing the crap out of yeah, each other. Yeah, he refers to them as, as their friends. Um yeah. But, yeah. Like they're friends, but I don't but think. But when he's Artemis there first confronts him them. about it, she's like, You and H are clans up, right? And he's just like, What, me? No, clan? Never. No way. Nuh uh. Not him. That guy? Nope. He could be a three hundred pound lady named Chuck. <laughs> <or whatever. laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, I loved H, man. I did. Yeah, I thought H was good. Yeah. I hated H. H was so poorly acted, and I didn't care about anything H had to say. I liked H almost exclusively in The Shining thing. And have either of you seen The Shining? Yeah. No. See, we don't do horror here at Bacon and Egg, and because I can't, I can't. The Shining isn't that scary. I've, okay. There was like an elevator full of blood. Okay. okay. That is in the movie. I yeah, know. That that. Well, movie. here's the thing: is that I think they did a good job because I have never seen The Shining, but I no, like none of it was lost on me. Like I, I think I'm familiar with the girls in the hallway. I'm familiar right. with the elevator of blood it's, and Jack Nicholson with the axe and the creepy old lady. It was a you know. good so replacement. The lady was the one thing I missed. It was a good replacement for War Games. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think... Because War Games would have been lost a, on people. There was a few things that I wanted them to go just... And these are nitpicky details, but if you're going to include the reference, I think you need to do the reference right. And there's a few things that I thought that they did wrong. Like, Iron Giant, the whole point of the movie is that he's not violent. That's the whole thing. Like, have you seen it? He's not a violent thing. So you could have done Megazord instead, and everybody would have been cool with it. Iron Giant, not me. Okay. And then, like, the holy hand grenade, you have to count to three. Oh my god. There's like a... I said that. I was like, he didn't yeah. count to three. Yeah, you gotta count to three. Like, you gotta count to three this... or five or whatever. You gotta count to three. Three shall be the number. Four. 
Yeah, they too didn't much. do that. They didn't do that. <laughs> One, he two, just threw it. Thou shalt not but, count like, to two unless thou then proceeds to three. Yeah. And I think that there could have been, like... I think if you're gonna, like... Obviously, you can't make the DeLorean time travel. That's fine. But you could have done, like, a little joke from Back to the Future, like, called Sorrento a butthead, or been like, this is a scale model of Sorrento's office. Sorry, it's not painted or to scale. Or just something like that. Just to, like, well, nod to it. And I, So what was with the scripting behind the whole hand grenade thing, though? Is because he throws it, and Show is like, how much did that cost? And Wade's like less than then it's, it's gonna, gonna cost, cost them, them. It's like, okay <laughs> that was the one part of the movie where i was like what why did you do that <laughs> why did you say that <laughs> but yeah, yeah so there was a few things one-liners. no there was a few things where i was like like i'm okay with you not drawing the references from the source material that's fine i get it there's a lot and you know what you nodded to joust because somebody mentioned it in the war room there was a war room which is kind of like war games and you did include the holy hand grenade so we have like the three right. big you ones talked you talked about Lutus. right loot it they had ludus they yeah, met they, Lutus you see in it there. in the beginning and they make they make a one reference to it yeah the schools on yeah, Ludus are going to be renamed after the school in the, uh ferris oh, bueller, bueller and... right yeah yeah Ben Mendelsohn. I liked Ben Mendelsohn. Yeah, he's all right. I mean, I think he did a good job. I think, okay, he did a good job I think acting. The character was stupid. I feel like the script didn't quite know what to do with Sorrento. Like, so, on the one hand, you have this guy who is, like, determined to win the contest. But, like, the, like... It seems like he has this super good rig, and he has this really intimidating avatar, but then he keeps hiring IROC to do stuff. Like, why, like he, why isn't he just capable of going out and doing the stuff, you know? Uh, right. And then, but then at the end, oh, he does have some moves. And, you know, he has the Mecha Godzilla. I was so glad they put, they had Mecha Godzilla. That oh, was yeah. great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was, I mean, you know, that kind of made it all okay. It's like, we're not going to get Ultraman. We do have Gundam, and we have Mecha Godzilla. There's a DeLorean, and he said Zemeckis' name. So, whatever. I'm game. That's the Master Chief. I rock, Hello. though. I was so prepared to hate I rock. Oh, my gosh. TJ Miller does it again. And he's just this big, gigantic, intimidating character with a skull for a body. And he, he's a, it's a dramatic music cue, and he's about to talk. And he's just like, yeah, no, my neck's kind of messed up, so if you could just stand on my left. Yeah. <laughs> to me, TJ Miller is just like a dirty Ryan Reynolds. And I don't mean dirty, like, raunchy jokes. I mean, like, a Ryan Reynolds that needs to take a bath. <laughs> That's what TJ Miller I've is. I've never liked TJ right? Miller in pretty much anything I've seen him in, honestly. I love T.J. Miller. What? I think he's hilarious. Ethan, you don't I like T.J. Miller? Not really. It just I feel like every part he's done could have been done better by somebody else. Have you seen Silicon Valley? I have not. I have not. That's oh, my main, gosh. That's why you don't like him, then. Okay. Out okay. Out. You need to see Silicon Valley. Yeah, so I've that heard. That is a great show. So I've heard. Uh, I just Is that a sitcom? It is, um, kind of, I it's guess. A I wouldn't say sitcom, no. Um, we were asking a... Uh, one of our upcoming guests about sitcoms they watched and they were like i watched silicon valley and i was like what that doesn't count i mean it's it's not hbo i don't think hbo does sitcoms but it's like a dramedy you know it's kind of like entourage but with yeah. tech geeks that's what i've heard i've i've not seen it but apparently there's some issues with tj miller right now oh yeah Why? uh I, I just there's a bunch of like allegations out against him and people are saying they like they don't ever want to work with him again because he's kind of problematic so he needs to take a shower because he's just Ryan Reynolds that hasn't taken a shower. Well, yeah, none of that information surprises me. I just think he's very funny on screen. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's it's you know he he'll probably be from what I've heard he'll probably be the next like big domino to kind of die. I didn't think he was that big of a deal. That's okay. He's been in a bunch of stuff. I did I did like Cloverfield. Is he in Cloverfield? Yeah. Uh that's that's a point lost on me. Cloverfield is just a great piece of cinema. It was like his first movie, I think. But anyway. As we're not okay. talking about Cloverfield right now. We're not talking about Cloverfield. We can later on, different episode. I'm sure we'll get there eventually. Um, so, but yeah, I loved I Rock in this movie. It was a great like comic relief villain. Yeah, he was good. He, was he good. also seemed to know what he was doing better than I O I. Better like, than anyone else. It, yeah. Right. Like like in the book, obviously I Rock is just this big idiot, and he's just there for like you know H and uh. Wade to just you know. Well, he's he's there to give away flex their muscles. And Wade's secret. Yeah, he he yeah. Ser- yeah he serves to first let you know that Wade and H are the extreme real deal. real deal gunters, and then he also tips off the Sixers to the copper key. So yeah. yeah, yeah, but that's it. That's his whole role in the story. And this one, he has a much bigger character. But I, I mean, I thought it was hilarious. I liked it a lot. I was fine with it. Um, yeah, that was good. Yeah, and he gets yeah, the he- catalyst <laughs> for Sorrento, and he's like, "You're not actually going to use." It. I thought that was just like a bluff. 
I've got 10 years with a gear here, man. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That was uh, something I had an issue with, is this whole, like, zeroing out thing. Like, there's no stakes to it. They made it seem, like, so silly. Like, oh, you'd zero out, you get right back into it. <laughs> well, yeah, but you get it back in with no gear I know, but it was just, like, it was way too big of a deal. They Like, they, in the book, the... it felt like you die, it's over. <laughs> I mean, I think in the book, they, like... he. D that's another thing where the book has the advantage of being able to, like, really world build a little more, where... Like yeah, suicide it's got, it's is a real paper. like suicide's a real thing in the real world that happens a lot in Ready Player One when their avatars die because it's like well I I've, I've literally actually just lost everything uh, like that's Wade's right. plan in the book is to kill himself if he like you know if he loses the contest or something right or if he if his avatar dies yeah I, well it's to me I think we're giving the book too much credit because it does do a better job of world building. You gotta remember that a book is text on a page and a movie is literally anything you want it to be because it's on a screen and you can literally build worlds. You like, one of the worlds you built was the world building world, Minecraft. You like, you can put anything on there. You can make it anything you want and you can communicate so much without so talking. I know this is that's a- It's the great thing, that's the other piece of well, it. Well that's, Tyler, I don't think you're, I don't think you're hearing world, world building the way I'm saying it, which is to say like, you can't like under, like yeah, you can put it on screen, but you can't like understand like the, the culture just by seeing it. Yeah. yeah. The way you can in the book. Well, I always thought when they were gonna make this movie, there would be a lot of opportunity for some like, gaming frustrations to go into it and i guess that would have just maybe bogged it down or whatever but just like traditional gaming things and i think i rock actually captures it really well where it's like you know you have this super intimidating character with all this great gear but then as soon as somebody talks to you it's like well you just talk like a normal person you, know, you don't do the whole you don't sound like a medieval prince or whatever your character is supposed right to be. like you he just, just has a regular just voice chat. Right. Right. unless yeah. you're h yeah so you could do that you could voice change yeah. Yeah. um i thought one of the dumber effects that kept bothering me was when they would they would do the, they did this a lot but they would like show you someone like in the oasis kicking somebody and then they'd cut to the real life person and show you them like tripping over a couch or something and it was like okay what if the couch wasn't there <laughs> You know, right. like they wouldn't have actually fallen over. Like they kept cutting to them, like interacting with real world things that were not present in the Oasis that they would like, like they would be hit in the Oasis and then their character would trip over it in real life. And it was like, it was so annoying. If this was real, everybody would just stand and play in big empty rooms. Like they would oh, just, that's the, uh, you wouldn't well, have honestly, a couch. Honestly, this is the other thing that bothered me was that like, that's basically how, for, I didn't like the way they represented the, the rigs, like where you, in order to play in the Oasis, you basically needed a big empty empty room with a treadmill and a bunch of wires attached to you and something holding you up so you could run in this omnidirect like uh, again i know we keep bringing it back to the book but this is like another another situation where like like for a majority of the book wade is sitting in a lawn chair in a t inside of a van playing with just the mask and the hands you know like right. I, I know what they're doing like they need to show you how it works and how it translates and it's an easier visual representation when you do it this way but it was like the fact that they had like four of them attached to rigs hanging from the ceiling in that van was like, mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. Minor complaint. On the topic of world building in a more literal sense than figurative sense, I know this is a thing in movies right now where everything's just blue and orange, but everything was blue and orange. Like, I, I, the, it just felt like there wasn't, in a world where you can do anything, anything, anything is possible, why would there be so much blue and orange? Why is every world dank? That, that is so true, and I, I really felt like that thematically didn't even fit yeah, with like, the movie. Like, the point is, you're escaping away from this darkness in the real world to this magical, colorful place in right. the Oasis. Like, everything look miserable? Yeah, Why like, it should have looked castle like... castle be on planet Doom? Right. Like, well, Doom is a classic video game. I know, but it's like a that's... miserable classic okay. video game full of death and destruction and murder and sadness and the color brown. It's true. I'm not arguing like, that. I think there should have been a lot more Mario Tennis type places. <laughs> I, I, no, Tyler, I think you're exactly right. Like, I, this is why I wish they did start on Ludus because it's such a good, like, safe looking, very bright green, blue sky environment. Yeah, the color where, green past Minecraft did not exist in this movie. Yeah, not much. Not much. It was like Minecraft and then yeah, Tennis Ludus... World and then Misery. And then, yeah, and then, oh, we're on planet Doom! And I also think that if you're going to say that, like, most people are disengaged from the contest, then I think. Like, in the book, it does a really good job of explaining that most people don't participate in the PvP aspect of this game at all. They just go there to exist, right? It's like Sims. Right. And right, it's like where business is handled, you go shopping there, you buy everything there, like, it is life. Right. So why on, like, 
why are more people not dressed normally? Like, why is the first person that runs into him at the uh, the library Beetlejuice? Right. And not... You know, I did like Emoji Man. I thought that was fun. I don't know if you caught that. Ben Artemis. <laughs> I don't think the, I saw that one. Artemis with the four-armed orc with uh, the alien thing with inside. Alien inside. Of it. That was pretty funny. Oh, oh she was I, she was a character from Mortal Kombat, her. right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. I, I guess. I don't know his name. But the alien thing was alien. Yeah. yeah. She's wearing the glove, and it's just like and he takes it off her hand. Oh man, when she goes, this isn't my real hair. I'm like, no sh. You're not a porcupine. Yeah. She was a fish person. I know, but she says, this isn't my real hair. It's like, you've got porcupine hair. Like, it's got the white right. tips it's and everything. Just... Right. And also, what a, what like a, if I was Wade, I would almost be mad. Be like, you said you were unattractive. Like, you. You are much better looking you... outside of the Oasis, and I am not. Right. <laughs> Wait a minute. I have no blue tattoos on my face. This isn't fair. None of their avatars, with possibly the exception of H, looked anything like them. Did you say with the exception of H? Yeah. <laughs> the girl did not look like H. I, I, more so than Parzival looked like Parzival. Well, I wasn't convinced that H's avatar was a man. I wasn't convinced that Parzival's avatar wasn't Jason Sudeikis with a wig. Really? He looks like Jason Sudeikis. Watch it again. He's got a real thin face. Jason's got a, a little more Yeah, but he's bod. got the, it's the, just the face parts, like not the cheek parts, like the face parts. Okay. He looks like if you made... <laughs> If you made Parzival into a we into a, like a wee me, he would look like Jason Sudeikis. Like a wee, like on the wee. Yeah, like on the wee. Like when you just take not you like take, a small version of <laughs> not Ethan. Not a small like version a, of Ethan. Like no, a, like the wee. But either way, he, that guy looked nothing like Ty Sheridan, and Avatar or Artemis's Avatar looked nothing like Olivia Cook. Yeah. Oh, I could see how Artemis was Artemis. N I couldn't. It was cool when they brought her back with the thing on her face at the end. I did like it. I almost wish it had been like like more severe. You know, it, it didn't seem like it was like even worth being upset over. Um, well, I mean, that well, being said, I don't thing. have a, a giant birthmark on my face, so I don't know how I would e feel. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so talked about the characters. No. What else do we want to say about the characters? Oh, I, I I don't know that we talked about Sorrento to my liking. I felt like or maybe we did. I don't know. He was just such like a comic book bad like he was like he was juvenilely the bad guy to the point where like the ending blow that kills sorrento in this high stakes serious movie fate of the world kind of thing is like a kick to the nads that like, was annoying. i was not about yeah. that yeah i, don't like I was that. like like why would you even wear the haptic suit that could hurt you there that <laughs> yeah, why would you wear the microfiber crotch mesh or whatever i know what right. was the point what was the point um like yeah again i think it's annoying because they had that whole meeting at the beginning where sorrento is basically trying to sell the like upper like the the executives at ioi that the contest is so important and this is why we need to continue to focus on it and it's like they know like he shouldn't be having to sell them on on this you know Be, like if right. if he's having to sell them on this he doesn't have 2,000 people with expensive rigs working for him already you know they, they've already been sold right. on it it's yeah that that seemed a little yeah there was how there's a few things within ioi that i was like they would have this wouldn't have happened like for example they explain it really well in the book how like if they die they just go to another rig but basically what it looked like in the movie was like if you die you run to another rig because you because because you do it and that's how that works instead of just standing at the same rig and respawning with like and logging into a different account no, I, you know i think when they died they like that person was done or they had to go put a new headset on basically like they had to get a new headset uh, into that spot because each headset was a different actual soldier right because this, the this ioi kind of they were they were i mean and it doesn't say this obviously but they're using hacked rigs to the point where it's not tied to their retinal signature it's probably tied to the headset and anybody can use that avatar uh, right I assume something like that oh the avatars are all the same. so I, I i saw this movie with a friend who hadn't read the book and he pointed out a good thing and that that i never really thought about just because it was so ingrained into me but he was just kind of like how does ioi just own people Oh, 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 oh. The because well, but yeah, in the in the book it talks very in depth about how like IOI is the world's largest credit card provider and the internet service provider. Like they own everything. Right, right. Whereas in the in the movie it was just kind of like yeah you rack up credit card debt and suddenly your life belongs to IOI. Congratulations. Yeah, they don't. Well, the way yeah they don't explain. They explain the, it a little bit. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. Um, but yeah, they they don't explain yeah. the indentured servitude very much 
in the movie. They just, like, r reference loyalty centers, like you're supposed to know what they are, and then yeah. she gets taken to one, and it's like... Uh, well, she yeah, kind of explains like what the loyalty center is when she talks about her dad dying there. Yeah. One one of the things I don't like this movie does, I've got a couple points to make. Well, I've got one point to make, and then I want to ask about Finale, the character added for the movie. Yeah. Uh, but the, the loyalty centers fall into this problem that I think a lot of movies do whenever there's a big corporation. And it's sort of like the how to succeed in business without really trying thing where it's like, oh, if this is a big corporation, you can just walk around and nobody knows anybody anyway. So nobody will notice you and you'll be totally fine. It's like, let me tell you something. If you work in the boardroom at IOI, you know everybody that works in the boardroom at IOI. And it's unusual when the indentured servants are just walking through. And it, I, it like drives me crazy because it's not something that would just normally happen like I worked for a big corporation and if you walked in and weren't one of the regular staff it was unusual like I didn't know who you were you were immediately Wait, questioned what are you talking about, about? yeah when does this happen in the movie when Artemis is like breaks out of a rig and then just walks upstairs and walks straight into Sorrento's office like it's nothing because she's wearing the IOI uniform well, they, I guess you don't see her walk past anybody like they don't show you her like having to get around she, a like, guard or something well, she, but she, like, breaks from the crowd. And, I don't know, I feel like somebody would notice a prisoner walking into Sorrento's Oh, office. I agree. Well, I agree, first of all, that she wouldn't have been able to just, like, open the door, that it would have been locked, or that there would have been guards. Uh, I also, I really hate how, like, mm, a, mm, a, a significant amount of the plot hangs on the fact that Sorrento has his password on a sticky note on his chair. Yeah, like, it, he's just kind of an idiot. Same password of a five year old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. It's like, dude, you're talking. This guy, this guy is supposed to be like man. genius level smart, you know? And it's like, yeah, I don't think he needs to write his password down, okay? That was, that felt a little cheesy and contrived, which is well, saying yeah, something in this like, movie. <laughs> right. And it's not like he was an idiot. Like, he was an intern for Halliday and, and Morrow. Like, right. He obviously was good at something at some point, and honestly, his idea to make, like, tiered membership isn't a bad idea. His idea for advertising to 80% of your line of vision is bad and evil. Yes. But, like, well, but you know, his idea for the membership, because like, I guess the way, like, I would, uh, the Oasis is already, like, a freemium problem, right? Like, Morrow and Halliday made their gazillions of dollars, not from the 25 cent entry fee, but from the transportation fares and all stuff like that. Like, the pay to win kind of stuff that yeah. was already a problem. So it's not like this was some Oasis of a video game where everybody got the fair chance and it was all honky dory. Like, if you had money, you were obviously better at it. Yeah. It was still a pay-to-win kind of problem. Mm -hmm. It's a mobile game, man. VR headset. But VR headset. what you what you get, in, and this is where the the movie fails the book in a way that it can't if you're not going to make it like the book. In that, like, you get Sorrento being the intern and talking to James Halliday and being like, hey, you should do different tiers of, you know, accounts or whatever. What you don't get in the movie is this whole James Halliday is this generous guy who doesn't want anybody to ever have to pay for it. Sure. Like, that's not said at all, but it's implied poorly. Right. It makes it seem like he's just bad at listening to people. Not like he's dismissing it, or he doesn't explain, like, no, it should be free for everyone or anything. Oh, I was under the impression that he was dismissing him. That he heard him and he was like, I'm not even going to entertain that thought. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I actually thought that was pretty well portrayed, mm -hmm. that Halliday was, was all about doing it for... Oh, I didn't get know. that at all from the movie. Well, they also... That they, I think they steal from Sorrento's credibility a little bit, where they say that the reason he gets the like the high up job at IOI is because he interned for Halliday and spent so much time with him, as opposed to like just actually being a great video game designer himself and a really smart person and like you know having like really solid business acumen and all that. Um, which yeah, it's like I, I have a hard time gauging how dangerous. Sorrento is supposed to be other than that he's really ambitious like is he personally like good in a fight it doesn't really ever seem like it you know and then he, he doesn't seem to care about the, like he says multiple times that he doesn't care about the oasis and like when Irock is explaining the eye of Osiavox he's like shut up I don't care about the, the stupid orb artifact of Osiavox don't say that again whatever <laughs> uh, yeah it's like it's like you're not even remotely engaged in the game and i get that you hate the game because you know holiday was so dismissive of you but it's just like like i don't believe that your avatar is a high level i don't think you would stand a chance in a fight with anybody honestly right you know if it wasn't for your giant mecha godzilla mech that you've never used before because i'm sure somebody would have spotted it right <laughs> like like oh my god look mecha godzilla <laughs> uh, well so let's talk about holiday like, for a second 
Also, oh, sorry, wait, hold on, no, 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 real quick. Uh, Artemis kills the Avatar for uh, Sorrento. Yes. Like, Sorrento's Avatar dies. So, well, why is he already suited back up as Sorrento in a new spot? Does he just have a ton of those big, beefy Avatars ready to go? That is an interesting point that I had not even considered. But yeah, he should Probably. just be gone, right? Yeah. He should be showing up as just one of the regular six or avatars, and then right. like, the reveal should be like, you can hear his voice or whatever. Right. And that would have told you they're using hacked rigs. Right. Mm-hmm. And they should be wearing jeans and black t-shirts. They, Partival well. was when, when he respawns. He does. They yes. did do that. That was good. But the Sixers are all supposed to be wearing that, aren't they? Yeah. Um, well, the well, ones they're that all, died. I mean, they're all wearing matching uniforms, which is the important thing. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, 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 let's talk about Halliday for a second. I did not have any issue with the way Mark Rylance acted it. I thought he did a really good job. Um, oh, it was genius. Some of the the scripting for him was kind of weird, like the portrayal. Like, I get it was a different James Halliday from the book, and I need to look past that. But, like, the James Halliday in the book would not have called it Halliday's Easter Egg. Is that? Yeah, okay. Like, because Anorak's like, think... let the hunt for Halliday's Easter Egg begin. I was like, that was weird. That was oddly. He also I think says... he does say that in the book. Does he? Yeah. And, and in the movie, he's like, three keys open three gates. There was three keys and two gates in the well, movie. And they also so, said it like... No, there's the third gate that they puts all three keys in, and they're all like, oh my god, just turn it in there, how hard is it? That was one thing There's I no had, copper gate, That though. was one thing I had an issue with, is that it uh, they they moved the poem around. Like, they changed the lines. Like, all the lines were still there, but they put them in a different order for no reason. Yeah. Well, and, and they take away from the Ludus thing where he's like, and the answer's up here somewhere. And that's supposed to be like a clue. No, he says that in the book. I know. Yeah. And that's supposed to be a clue that it's on Ludus. I mean, yeah. Well, but... I, don't, I don't even know if it is. The, because yeah, the real clue so. is the uh, the first thing they decipher from the almanac. Um, yeah, about the Tomb of Horrors. About the Tomb of Horrors. But you, you could, you'd never figure that out. Uh, yeah, I did. Nobody I thought it was, I mean, that. I guess I, it was fine. But they sort of like reverse. They didn't really mention, all, they didn't really mention the gates at all in the movie. Maybe. So yeah, in, in the book you have to find a key which opens a gate and then you have to complete the gate and then you get the next clue. This was more like you have to decipher a clue to find the gate and then clear the gate to get the key, which is kind of pointless because it just lets you unlock something else that gives you the next clue. So, like, why didn't you just get the clue to begin with? I don't know. Uh but they did a great job of making, of separating Halliday and Anorak. Like, he is much more confident in just his speech as Anorak. That's true. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. True. So that was, that well, was that's, cool. I mean, that's, yeah, and that's how it's supposed to be, is that Anorak is, like, like he's comfortable through the, the rose-colored lenses of the Oasis. You right. Know? Like, that's where he's human. They definitely played up, maybe, maybe I just am more interested in the references in the book, but they definitely played up the relationship with the girl a lot more in the film. They did. I mean, she wait, liked, let's, hmm? let's talk about the, the switch with Og, right? The, just the role reversal in the, in the film and that he is the, whatever it's called. The curator. The curator. curator. I did not oh, catch that, that the first time. And the second time you can very clearly tell it's Simon Pegg. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely genius. I did not it, catch that it. Was like, I never would have caught it. I was I was so happy. I was watching the movie and he was like, I'm the curator. And I was like, are you joking? Get the front That's door so out of cool. town. <laughs> yeah. Get the heck out of here. I, I did like I was that. Like, but I did not like that how how Parzival gets the quarter. Uh, like, you know, it's such, a, it's such an accomplishment in in the book when he has like he sets the world Pac-Man record game. on pragman like set, gets the, the the perfect score yeah this I and mean, this well, is literally thought... ogden morrow reaching into the contest and interfering you know it's like he does that he's like choosing him right there it's i felt like that was but he's but he's choosing him because ogden morrow was married to her and was like there's no possible way that she's only mentioned one time in this entire thing and he's the curator and parzival's like actually it is and i think at that point morrow is like holy crap this kid knows more about knows more about my journals than i do right knows yeah knows more about all of this than even than anybody even realized so i think that's why he chose him i don't think it was some arbitrary like oh i lost a bet i think it was like oh my god he just realized something that i never would have pieced together because it was so obvious to me that she would be part of the journals because she was such a huge part of our lives i thought i actually thought it was a really cool way of doing it if you weren't going to have him sit there and play pac-man for six hours mm, i don't know so i don't know i want him but i also would have been down with the pac-man Sorry. thing i lied earlier I'd be totally cool with it. Go ahead. Uh, I want to move on from characters here for just a second. There are some things this movie does really well, and there's some things it doesn't do very well, and I want to bridge that gap by talking about Simon Pegg. I don't know what they left out of it with Simon Pegg's character, with 
the, the great and powerful Og, but there's no way they paid him however much he was asking to be in three scenes. Well, if, you, if he's the curator, you know, he's in a lot more. I mean, still, like, I just, I feel like he was underutilized in the movie. Since you don't know he's a curator until the end of it, like, I, f I feel like there was some, there's something missing there. That was the time I definitely felt like there was something missing. Mm. Yeah, they missed the opportunity in the, uh, the dance globe thing for him to come out and zap everybody. Um, like that, that's the big reveal, like, where you get to see a glimpse of the power of, like, Halliday and Moro inside the Oasis in, at least in the book, where he get, uh, Artemis and Parzival get invited to the, his birthday party, and then the Sixers invade, and he just, like, zaps them all, and so, they miss out on that a little bit, I agree, they could have shown him. A little more just, there. To me, it legitimately felt like there's there were scenes missing, like that that they were shot. And this is the same way I felt about the high five thing and the fact that they they mention uh, artifacts right at the beginning of the movie as like artifacts are super important. This is going to be a huge part of the movie, and then it, they don't mention the word again. Oh, I felt like, well, like I Gundam. They're getting to Gundam at the beginning, right? But like it, it just it puts this play as like artifacts are a huge deal, and I feel like there was something missing there. There's something missing with the high five. There's a bunch of different parts where it's like you you set something up that never came to fruition. No, it does come I, to I fruition. Like agree. all of the like the orb of Azivox comes into play later and the cataclyst and the gundam you know the quarter they all come back uh yeah but i think i think what ethan's saying is like you can tell between scenes that there's like something is not quite right here like i would have accepted wade sitting there on a couch talking to h and like kind of turning this quarter around in his hand and being like i can't take this out of my inventory and i don't know why or, you know, something like that. Sure, sure. Well, and just the pacing of the whole movie was completely messed up. Well, yeah, like, it was like lots and lots of plot and then nothing yeah, you get to time. You get to Artemis I Love You in like 20 minutes. Yeah, he speeds into being in love with her. Right, and it's like you feel like there was a thing you missed there where like they met and hung out and did stuff. And it's like, nope, yeah. you've met three times. Ever. Yeah, I agree with you there. It does feel like there were some scenes missing. Where there was a little so the, more the pacing is a little bit wonky, building. and the yeah. third act takes like half the movie. Well, that's what they're. It's not how I pictured. Sorry, no, Jake. Oh, I guess I've, I've interrupted. Yeah, too many I, I mean the third act obviously is going to that. What they're building up to is just the big fight with all of their licensed characters from every franchise. Oh, ever. for sure, for sure. You know, yeah. like, and you got to have that. And obviously, that's going to be a big part. But uh, do you think? Do you think any brands were like, "Holy crap, you want to put us in there?" Yes, <laughs> obviously. What does that cost? <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure Overwatch, <laughs> whoever makes Overwatch did that. I think Blizzard? I think Blizzard was like, I don't know, World of Warcraft's doing pretty good for yeah. us. They definitely paid to have Overwatch in that movie as much as it was. Uh, Street Fighter, I think they went a little overboard on. There was so yeah, much Street is. Fighter. Yeah. So you think that was a Hadouken at the end? or a... Oh, that's 100% a Hadouken. He says it. Oh, yeah. he does? Yeah, he says Hadouken. Yeah. Oh, I thought we were... He's just like, Hadouken! Like, and then even the next, like, the little kick thing he does, I think was a, is a Guile move yeah. as well. So, yeah, he, it's like, he just straight up Street Fighters him at the end. Why would no one Sorrento be wearing the crotch thing? What, what, <laughs> what point This dude doesn't even serve? care about the game. Uh, I guess maybe he's a pleasure seeker. Also, why, do, why does everybody else's Oasis rig look better than Nolan Sorrento's? <laughs> right. Like, all the body like, suits look way more comfortable and more useful, and Sorrento's is just, like, armor? It's like 20 pieces. Yeah, it, it was like way too many pieces. It looked like cheap. It didn't even look like futuristic or cool. No, it looked, it looked like, like plastic. Yeah, it looked like plastic modern day technology right. that you would have today. And that everybody would not else has the well. X1. Right. It, they were pushing that X1, man. I th that better be a product here pretty soon. Because there was just a commercial in the middle of the movie for the X1 suit. Right. It was like <laughs> yeah, that one out was of nowhere. Weird. Every punch. It was like, I feel it. Every bullet. What? That's not. I don't want to feel. Who bullets. wants to get shot? Well, they make yeah. They make the the impact like the haptics a little too heavy. You know, like they get punched and they fall over. Like you're you're supposed to be able to like tell you got hit, not actually get hurt. Yeah, where like Artemis kicks Wade right. and he falls over for thirty seconds. Yeah. Oh man. That being said, speaking of the gear there is one thing this movie did good that i was 100 percent positive they were going to suck at and i i really thought they were going to suffer from what i call like uh the tony stark slash power ranger face mask mode where clear oh, i know exactly what right we're like about. clearly you're this person should have a helmet on but also clearly someone's agent said robert downey jr's face needs to be on screen not Iron Man. So let's keep that mask up as much as possible. And I was positive that they were going to consistently be showing you them in the real world with their masks off or 
like rather than the in-game character and i was impressed by yeah. how they handle that they they are not afraid to stay in the oasis for there was one really times. cool scene where you get a shot of wade outside the oasis with the visor on and you can see sorrento talking to him on the inside of his visor that like you can cool. see through the visor and there's just a, like a little image of sorrento's face talking to him and i was like that's that was a cool detail yeah they did the same thing with uh sorrento you can he, he's laying on the on his little rig or whatever yeah that rig doesn't okay like okay everybody else has to run around and do that does Sorrento not have to run? I know! It was confusing. It was like, do you have to stand up and run around or not? Because it, like, this is... it. I think what bothers me is that it's like, if you've ever... It's not... Like, if you're playing... Like, when the Wii just came out, you know, there was all this, like, motion control ways to play the game. And then there was the, like, use a joystick way to play the game. Yeah. And it's like... Right. Uh, as much fun as motion controls and stuff are... Uh, they do not make you better at the game, you no. know, like... They make you worse, like, generally. Yeah, generally they make you worse. So, like, if you can play, like, with precision, with the joystick, and sit down and play, like, you have a whole army of people here. Are you making them... Why are you making them physically run if you can just have them sit in a chair and not get actually exhausted? You know, like, I don't... Right. You're wearing your army out needlessly. I don't get it. It was... Yeah. Well... So, I was under the impression from the books, and because he says it's a Habishaw IR-1 or whatever, right? And the sure. Habishaw 1 in the book are the ones that are in, like, little circular rooms. So, I was yeah, under the impression that like Sorrento's the... ball closed up. But it didn't. And you never see it, because the only time he's using it is when he's in it. Right. I also don't... I, I This movie did one of those things where it's, like, infinite hacker power. Where it's, like... I don't know how it works. I don't know how hacking works at all, but I'm certain they can't do what they just did. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certain that's not how it works. I don't know how hacking works, but I'm 100% positive that teenagers can't do it in 10 seconds to the world's largest internet provider. I'm positive of that. Right, right. They're like, we caught him just as he <laughs> right. was logging out. I'm like, that's not how that works. Uh, also, also that didn't scene, you need his face mask? That scene just did not make sense at all. Like, they're like, why yeah, would we you got leave the right door open? Well, they're like, we got him right as he was logging out. Out. But it was like, then he would have physically been taking the visor off. Like, right. Like, he would have succeeded. In yeah. Did you, the visor did you like, you, you tricked him into thinking he took the visor off? Like, what's happening here? Why didn't he actually take it off? I don't, yeah. It, they like tried to like play it off like it was some crazy inception thing. Yeah. It, it, but it just wasn't. It just wasn't. It was just like, it was like, yeah, because he would have physically, in the real world, taken the visor off, and somehow they got him to think think that he'd done it. And I, I just don't understand how he could have been like, did, oh did no, they, yeah, it's not, uh, we got it, we got it, we're good. I did I like it. the awkwardness of the logout thing, where like they would put their hands up to their face and then just vaporize. That was funny. I thought that was super cool. Yeah, yeah, it was it was tight. Like when Ar Artemis did it in Ace Search Workshop, and she's just like, yeah, okay, bye. And just this sarca sarcastic hand motion and pops her thing off. But you can't see the visor, also, so it's just like she just grabs the air around her face and then explodes. Right. I feel like if there was a little piece of exposition I wanted that they didn't give me, because I kept talking about how, like, the real world is the only place to get a good meal. You don't see any one person eat anything in the whole movie. Hmm. Well, that All was you a, see just is a some quote taken some directly carrots. from the book. I don't care. Then t take it and give it some context. Have Wade, if you can do all this, like, talking over, be like, just like the first thing he says, be oh, like, no, they get, they get pizza delivered. The, pizza right is delivered. But I, just have Wade be like, there's one thing I love more than the Oasis. It's a freaking cheeseburger. That's all I need. <laughs> And then, like, have a shot of him when he's with Artemis biting into a Wendy's cheeseburger. That's all I want. I'm not a big fan of reality, but it is the only place to get a decent meal. For now. Groucho Marx. Yeah, that was said in, like, the 30s. Yeah. Oh, I think. I don't, I don't really know off the top of my head what decade the Marx Brothers are in. I think it's pre-1950. But... I have seen whatever movie that is. They, there's a bunch of them. Uh, anyway. So, uh, were, were you... A lot of people have been upset about this movie by the, the out-of-Oasis scenes. Like, when they're just, like, being human beings outside of the Oasis. A lot of people were bummed mm. out by it and felt like it didn't do a good enough job of driving the story. Interesting. Do you agree with that? You, you both uh, of you. Let's see. I, did, I mean, the problems I had were more with, like... Like, Daito was, like, in the real world, also really good at martial arts... You know, I was like, uh, yeah, when I don't it know kicks finale that. out of the yeah, it's like afraid not, friend. The point is, you guys are supposed to be like total recluse dorks, dorks who like are physically terrible at everything and are really, really good at this video game. Uh, I didn't like that. I, di I didn't really mind the real world stuff. I thought the I thought they did a good job with his relationship with his aunt Alice, where it seemed maybe a little bit more like they were on at least like 
I love you deep down kind of terms. So like he might have actually been upset. Like they gave Wade an emotional connection to his aunt that doesn't exist in the book. Where yeah, well, he just in the hates book, her. Right. In the book, the killing of his aunt in the trailer explosion just serves to show Wade how severe the Sixers want to win. Whereas in this one, it was like he actually cared that she died. Right. Well, I didn't. I didn't even think he cared that she died. I thought just on the question of like the real world versus the the oasis, the stacks were exactly what I. Yeah, yeah. That was, stacks that were was perfect. Great. Well, if we're gonna talk about the that stacks, was... we have to mention something reprehensible here. Parzival Wade Watts suffers from what is known as the Prometheus School of running away from things. Oh my gosh, it's he true. totally does. Where the stack is falling it's over true. and actually... he runs in a straight line away from it. Yep. Stop uh... doing that. Not good, Wade. Was Ridley Scott a big deal in the 80s? Uh, I mean, he made Alien. Well, there you go. That was in 1970. Yeah, but it was in this yeah. movie. Correct. So maybe that I was a little I am a, a Prometheus joke. apologist. I loved Prometheus. More than 99% of people. But I can't... I can't you know didn't that. see it. I didn't see it either. Do you know how busy Ridley Scott is? He does like 15 movies yeah. a year. That's right. Well, anyway. he's a, he's a, gets a production credit on everything because he, like, owns the company. He owns Scott Free Productions. Anyway, he did Blade Runner, so there's a little nod to that. <laughs> the nod to Blade Runner is <laughs> <the> Wade <laughs> running directly away from the falling stacks. So, but do, do y'all... That is exactly how James Halliday would have Y'all know what I'm referring to, right, with this. Like, you, neither of you have ever seen Prometheus, so... I am familiar with the Prometheus school of running away from well, things on Cinema Sins. I'm gonna, I'm to gonna say it for problem. people that don't know what I'm talking about here okay. on the podcast. Essentially, in the movie prometheus there's many scenes of people in very low gravity running straight away from things that are falling over like, like tall, tall things are falling over and the person's like running down the shadow of that thing falling over on them it happens right. five or six times in the movie and it's all very slow because things don't fall over in, nor- in like fast gravity on this planet they're on so it just it's like 30 seconds of the person just like huh, whoo, whoo, running away from this thing i'm like step one foot to the left yeah you can just turn left or right and you'd be you'd be just fine yeah it's gonna take 10 minutes to fall over but and it does a bunch of times that movie anyway i love that movie it's not the movie we're talking about but it is a movie that i like more than most people like and it's a prequel to alien while while we're talking about ridley scott did you know that he directed the uh the first apple macintosh personal computer commercial short film thanks fun fact why the lady running with the hammer why would i know that who who knows that i do now now everybody does anyway i just saw that on imdb that's all anyway um Dieto and Show. Why is he called Show? You want to talk about yeah, yeah. You want to talk about how there's clearly scenes missing from this movie is that they are considered like main characters and nothing, nothing from them. They're like, oh my gosh, Show, you're 11 years old. It's like I don't think he said a line in the Oasis. At he this did, point. right? Maybe one. He said thing, the I had says, to watch through my fingers. Yeah. For, for uh, The Shining. Yeah, right. But, like, like you're not important characters. You're just on for the ride, it seems like. Why is he uh, called Show? Was, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That why? was so pointless. Why would you change his name? <laughs> yeah, it, why is it from show to, or Shoto to Show? It added nothing. Yeah, I don't know why he was a ninja either and not a samurai. Uh, uh, that was confusing. Or, it, like, seemed pointless. Ninjas don't hug, Jack. Okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so that's what he I said. I honestly, it, when... It, it, but pre-going into the movie... I wasn't even sure if Daito and Shoto were going to be in the movie. I was like, I can just see them cutting them because, like, realistically, they... They're kind of pointless. Like, if you're going to water down the movie... Like, yeah, so so in in the book, they serve a couple of key purposes. They serve yeah, one... Uh, to help to for Wade to get the beta capsule and turn into Ultraman. They like provide a, a reason there. Two, they demonstrate how people who haven't met can like treat each other like they're actual brothers in the Oasis, so it's just more world building there. And then three, Dioto also dies, which just is another way to demonstrate the like ambition of the Sixers and like their terribleness. So like those are their three main purposes in the story in the book, but mm, you can get away with pretty much not having any of that in the movie if you wanted like they're just there to because they're they're basically there because their characters were in the book but yeah i don't think they really do very much at all they're just sort of there for the ride well the gundam thing does a little bit but you could have had you could have easily had the iron giant doing all yeah you very much could have you could have had artemis have um the gundam or like that's what you know what that could have even been better because at the beginning they could have been like they could have been like fighting to get the gundam or whatever and And then just at the last second some yeah some mystery person gets it and they're like oh who was she and then she shows up at the race that would have been way better yeah that that might have worked out a little better 
Um, and then at the end, she's in the sixer place, and then she's like, oh, no, I'm not anymore. Bing, bang, boom. I've got the beta capsule. I choose Megazord. <laughs> Megazord versus Megagodzilla. Every time I Mechagodzilla. reread the book, every time I reread the book, all That's I can I, think I is that. I would have chosen Megazord from the Mighty Morphin era. Yeah, and nobody does. I don't know. Yeah, no, and, the, and no one does. <laughs> Even in the they, book, they kill the Voltron guys before they can become Voltron. <laughs> I know, like, guys, you had, like, ten minutes to do this before the battle <laughs> yeah. started. What are you what waiting for? What were you for? doing? Also, Voltron couldn't have, like, the, the point of Voltron is that he can't lose, so I don't know why he didn't do that ahead of time. That was unfortunate for you. Um, also, that the fact that they had to have the five lions for Voltron makes me wonder if, if you wanted to do a Megazord, if you'd need five people with the separate zords. I would think or so. If you, I wonder if there was a high five available for Oh, that, you know? yeah. You know, that would have been great. If, if only if, Wade wasn't so obsessed with Supida Man. Oh, my gosh. That was the dumbest thing in the book. I'm like, that... That that is not Wade being obsessed with Spider Man. That is Ernest Klein being obsessed with Spider Man. <laughs> Which don't get me wrong. If Spider Man gets a giant fighting robot, he's way better than Spider Man. <laughs> like if he's just Spider Man with a giant robot, like there's no downside to that. Just saying. I think sidebar. I like that they did Gundam because Gundam is one of those things that like I don't really know a lot about, but I know is like an obscure enough reference. Where if they had Ultraman in there, I would have been like, I don't have a freaking clue what this. I is. wouldn't have known except for having read the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, except right, for but I don't know what Ultraman looks like. I don't. You know, he looks Let's like. Look him up. Look him up right now. Looks like a man in a suit. Yeah, I assume he just. It, it sort of makes it sound like he's just a man. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, exactly. he looks okay. great. I know exactly who that is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now I do. Oh, man. I've seen this they person. They totally should have done this. I've seen this person in many a GIF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think I mean, I mean, if you wanted to do a different major character, you could have done like. Optimus Prime. No, you couldn't have done Optimus Prime. That would have been lame. Why is the Iron Giant in this Prime movie? I think Optimus Prime is still going. Yeah, I, I think I think they did Iron Giant because they were like, we have the licensing for this. Uh, that That's my reasoning. Everybody loves the Iron Giant. Well, and it's not like Brad Bird was like, no, you can't have Iron Giant. Like He was busy doing the Incredibles too. He didn't have time to care. Yeah. I am not an Iron Giant apologist. I actually think Iron Giant is like a garbage film. And I know I'm in the minority with that. I hate this movie. I absolutely despise it. And I don't even know that I think it's bad. I think it's because Cartoon Network one time said, we're just going to play nothing but the Iron Giant for 72 hours. And for whatever reason, I watched it like back to back to back to back like five times. And I did this to myself. I brought it upon myself. But I hate this movie. Like, so it makes me cringe. when I went to see this movie in theaters on Wednesday, they gave me a poster that is... 85% Iron Giant. Like a Ready Player oh, One. Oh, really? Ready Player One movie poster. And it's like, it's got the name of the movie in the corner, and it's got a, an Iron Giant across the whole thing. It's gigantic. It's like, it's like a really big poster, and it's got Wade sitting on one of the shoulders, and it's just a giant picture of the Iron Giant. And I'm like, man, if only I liked that movie a lot. Because <laughs> like, this it was never my favorite cool. movie when I was a kid. I watched it. I don't get me wrong. I didn't have a problem with it. It's just like, I was not a an Iron Giant, you know, super fan. Yeah, I have not seen it, so I'm gonna refrain from uh, commenting on it. I, my impression of the Iron Giant was that it was like a very gentle creature, and so watching this movie, having not actually seen <laughs> Iron Giant, I was like, oh, I was wrong. That is a violent robot. No, he Man, is, I didn't know he, he had so a, many guns. He is a very gentle robot that does not kill okay. people. Right. And that's kind of well, his the, whole the Iron thing. Giant. Right. He's but he has like an anger mode where he is like a like he can be a war right. robot. And that's the whole point is him is... not being activated like that. He's like giant Baymax. Sure. Yeah, but if Baymax could really do Baymax a lot of damage. Baymax could definitely do a lot of damage. Uh, he, well, only because He could like spread the play. Only because Hero outfits him with armor. If you put a if you put a like a murder card in Baymax, you'd be in trouble. He's a balloon. Yeah, not if he didn't have the armor. He's on. a balloon with armor. Yeah, with the armor. Without the armor, Without the armor he's, he's a, balloon. Just a balloon. I love that movie. Sidebar. Oh, me too. Big Hero Six is great. Great. Can't wait for Big Hero Seven. Seven. <laughs> Five. Didn't five? I didn't I get know. that it was Is supposed it... to be like because there's six of them. I literally thought that I missed something. No, like, what's the name? <laughs> what's the six for? <laughs> I, was like, I was like, were there five of these movies that I just missed somehow? <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't. Yeah, no, I think, no. It's because there's six if you count the robot. Yeah. I think I think it's blah, blah, blah. It's talking about other movies. Yeah, TJ Miller's in that too, yeah. Ethan. Yeah. Yeah. He is. He's Fred. Uh, this movie, a lot of people are drawing comparisons, and Ethan read it in the review to Wreck It Ralph. I think that's just because of the yeah, video game because thing. Of the video game yeah. Thing. Uh, they're just like, mm, video games? Wreck It Ralph. Yeah, that's stupid. I don't, I don't see much of a comparison. 
Yeah, to me, it's all. more like a watered-down Matrix. You know, you plug in, you get superpowers, Wade's God. Yeah, yeah. you just suddenly know Kung Fu. Yeah. You, you know, uh, what's what do they call it? Travoltatron? What? <laughs> Travoltra. Or uh, the uh, the Travoltra. the dance software. Yeah, yeah it's not the Travoltron, yeah. I think. Yeah, that sounds right. Oh, I didn't catch that. Well, that's in the book. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 gotcha. gotcha. But he, he uses yeah. it. I thought there was... Ethan was right. When I watched it the second time, I paid much more attention to the script. Or not to the script, to the to the score. Ethan told me it was better than I thought it was, and he was right about that. It is a really good score. But, with like, I wanted more... 80s music. I would like you can put in Dead Man's Party by Oingo Boingo. It's not like a weird song that you could have had over some action sequences. I didn't really want more 80s music, honestly. Like I I'm not usually a huge fan of songs in movies. Like I generally think a movie is better told using music that was crafted for the movie. But like Guardians of the Galaxy was made better because of I, all of those references from the 80s. Disagreed. Like, and I, I think didn't, I was not crazy about the whole like, oh, let's use a different song every five minutes in Guardians of the Galaxy. That was one of the things that irritated me about that movie in the first place. Ethan, it just sounds like I don't think you understood Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm just, I'm just it's saying this is freaking amazing. This is one man's wrong. opinion on Guardians of the Galaxy, but like I, I like the amount of music we you're got. You're right. It is, it is one single person on the planet's opinion that's about fine. Guardians yeah, of the Galaxy. That's fine. I rated <laughs> it. I rated it very highly in our list, and then it got knocked no. down a little bit when we reviewed some other stuff. But when it came out, I re- or when we got to it, I rated it very highly. Um, but like I, I, I was happy with the amount of music we got. It in is. So I thought that. All right. Uh, I think as far so with the eighty stuff. I didn't I didn't stick through the credits, but I guess apparently after Hollow Notes they start doing a bunch of eighties music. Yeah, I stayed through the whole something. credits because I figured yeah. there would be an Easter egg scene. And there's not, but there's not. Yeah, it yeah. seemed like a pretty great place for it to be. I thought it was interesting how they handled the 80s stuff in this movie because, like, it's definitely not a part of winning the contest almost at all. Like, I think that in you know, like, I understand why they did that for the movie, because you want... They made the contest much more about understanding James Halliday's personal life, which made it easier for the movie-going audience to, like, follow along and, like, play the game with them and, like, understand stuff without having to have an existing knowledge of 80s culture that if you didn't know, hey, at least Ernest Cly can explain it to you in quick summary in the book, like, you couldn't do that in the movie. So I understand why they dropped it, but I liked how... They still made it, anytime Halliday himself was on screen, they made him just, like, dripping in 80s culture. Like, it was still obviously a big part of him personally, it just wasn't a big part of the contest. Yeah, the denim jacket and the Space Invaders t-shirt. Yeah. Well, they almost made it like a like a misnomer that, like, in order to win the contest, you must be obsessed with Halliday's interests. And it's like, yes, and there's all these people you can see that are studying the 80s and are so you know, interested in the 80s. Because you can see in the Oologist room, they've got, like, old comic books and Atari 2600 and all this stuff. Uh, but, like, you have to be obsessed with Halliday's other interests to figure out the... Like, you have to be obsessed with the thing Halliday was interested in that you wouldn't, like, you couldn't be interested in. Which is Karen Marlowe. Like, which yeah. is Kira, yeah. Right. I think, well, like, even in the book, that's, like, his fail-safe is, like, you have to have basically gotten to know him so well that... You knew that James Halliday only referred to that he, that one that he was in love with Kira, and that he only ever called her Lucosia, and like that's his password at the in the Crystal Gate. But uh, yeah, it's 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 really drummed up a lot more in the movie, and like made pretty obvious how he feels about her. Yeah, yeah. Og didn't did, Og, Og didn't seem too upset about that. Nope. <laughs> but getting back to music, I was a fan of the music. We're not going to take it by Twisted Sister for that battle scene. I, I when, was too. when he they you know are riding over the ridge and he just pulls up the boombox like uh who is it uh John Cusack style and just plays it yeah. say anything is that the song from say no. anything though no, I'm sure no. It's not. <laughs> I don't remember he what he plays but that would be a super weird song for that moment what <laughs> Uh, but no, the score was excellent. It, it made me feel like it was one of those like 80s, 90s movies, you know, a John Williams movie, for lack of a better word, uh, or an Alan Silvestri movie, because this was Alan Silvestri. Uh, but it, it wasn't like direct references. They didn't steal themes or anything. It was it was all new themes, but it just kind of harkened back to a time when movie scores were kind of gentler, I guess is the word for it, not so in your face. There was a lot more like woodwinds and a lot less blaring horns. You saying it wasn't like Inception? It was not like Inception. Or like uh, like the Avengers is going to be with that theme they're going to play every six seconds. The Avengers is going to be great. I'm excited for that movie. I'm hopeful, but again, horrified and concerned. I'm, yeah, I'm what are you concerned about, Ty? Well, there's... Well, 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 well
It's a twofer. I'm afraid it's going to be Deathly Hallows Part 1 with superheroes. What do you mean by just Part 1? It's just... Well, it's part one of two. Are they? Do- is that how Infinity War well, is, is working? Well, regardless, yeah. regardless of whether it ends up being, because nobody's really sure right now. Regardless of whether it ends up being a part two, it is going to be a part two because it's a year later. Like, it's it's there's not this movie's going to get overshadowed. The first one. Plus, plus Jay, there's not been a lot of Hawkeye in the promotional materials. <laughs> oh really? You don't think you uh, don't think the guy with the bow and arrow is going to make a huge difference in this fight? <laughs> well. Well, Jay, I brought eleven arrows. As a trilogy, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to cut him out. He was a huge deal. He was the one Loki takes over in Avengers one, and then in Avengers two, they go to his house, and Captain America rips a log in half. It was super cool. And as a trilogy, it doesn't make any sense to not have him in there because these are like his home base movies. Like these are where he thrives. You know, everywhere else, he's just he's just a character, and he's in it. We know he's in it anyway. So I'm what I was saying, I, if like if it ends up. All I'm saying. It, it ends up being Avengers 3.5 or Avengers 4, and it's a completely new story. Either way, it's like it's gonna be bigger and better, and we already know it's coming out and when it's coming out and everything like kind of about it like that. Do we have a cast? I don't think we have a cast. It's for. gonna be all of the people that don't die in this one. That's yeah, exactly. But like, that's I'm just afraid that I'm afraid that's it's the, gonna be that little caveat right there. That's my I'm afraid concern. it's gonna be kind of half, <laughs> and then it'll just be kind of half a movie. I don't know. But we'll see. I'm excited. I'm more excited way. for that I than don't. Solo. I'm less scared about Infinity War than I am about Solo. Oh, nothing makes me more anxious than uh, Star Wars movies coming to theaters. What if they suck? <laughs> well, what if they're great, Ty? Then what if they're great? We just deal with it and move on. Here's here's the thing about Star Wars is that you're never not going to go find out. You're never not going to see it. That's, I know. That They've got me. I'm hooked. You're hooked. Totally hooked. Nothing you can do. You're going to see every Star Wars movie, except the ones that come out after you die. Because they'll still be making oh, no. them. They make Star Wars movies you, infrequently enough that everybody goes and sees them. You, you will not they're, live they're, to see the last Star Wars movie. You know? Probably not. I either. know. Isn't, the, isn't that disappointing? That kind of makes you think about like those things where it's like, one day you set your child down and never pick them up again. Wow. That's a terrible thought, too. Yeah. New dad. How you feel about that? I don't like that. I don't <laughs> like that. He rolled over today. He's growing up so fast. <laughs> He is growing up so fast. I saw my nieces this weekend, and they're, they're they've they've grown up so fast. Compared, and now Luke is growing so fast. Oh man, it's stressful. I'm gonna need everybody to stay young forever. Forever. And nobody For the rest ever grows. life. Man. Who knows? Why do you think you get concerned about? Is it because like your own mortality comes into it, or is it like I just really liked cuddling babies, and now I can't do that anymore? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's an easy solution for that. It's just have another child, right? Uh, ah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Now you're speaking my wife's mm. language. <laughs> I've picked up on that. She, You know, it's subtle. It's subtle. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Real subtle. Yeah, it's, uh, hashtag it's not subtle. <laughs> it's not subtle oh no man yeah fair enough uh let's do some wrap up let's let's kind of move into that let's section. do it so did we miss anything did, did, do you have any burning desires questions comments that you need to talk about here's here's the thing ethan is i could talk about this all day but you know if you want more of my thoughts on ready player one you just gotta hop on over to the bacon and eggs discord Available for just $5 a month, patreon.com slash bacon and eggs. You can ask me any question. You can also join our book club, which is the same thing. It's all the same. It's all in the same Discord. But uh, you can ask me any question you want about Ready Player One, and I'll I'll talk about it. That's, there's that. There you go. Anyway, yeah, no, I have no other thoughts. I mean, I do, <laughs> but nothing else I can share right now. I have one final thought. <laughs> go for and it. And that thought is scorpions. Scorpions. End of, <laughs> end of thought. Fair enough. So... Guys, just give me a, give me a, a do you like it? Did you like it? Did you enjoy it? I will I not only did I like it, I am nigh certain. I think does that mean near certain? Is sure. that the same thing? I am near certain that I will buy the the Blu-ray and digital copy of this movie. There you go. Uh yeah, I did like I, it. I I liked it as well. I don't know if I will be purchasing it, but uh do you guys do ratings? Is that do you give it a score? We're getting there in a second. Okay. Yeah. I, oh, Jay, I very much we do enjoyed a great it. Thing here. We give it a breakfast you food. You give it a breakfast food. Okay, excellent. That's amazing. Okay, great. I like it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Something Wade never enjoys. <laughs> You're so mad that Wade didn't eat. <laughs> so like, there's upset never, there's about rarely, Wade not eating. Listen, there are like 
two cinematic situations where I want to see somebody eating. A, Rusty in Ocean's <laughs> Eleven. Yes. Constant. B, Ron Weasley, and C, this. Because Ron is Fair also enough. always eating. Okay. That's he is, but that is such a stupid movie-only thing. Correct. Okay. Which, you, we can discuss this as much as you'd like. If you, For just $5 a month, you can join the Bacon and Eggs God. Book Club, where this month we're discussing Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Oh, um, Does Ron really eat that much? I don't think he really eats that much. I think he, really I think he just, when there's food, he eats, he just, like, stuffs a lot of it in his mouth. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to put this movie on our Bacon Eggs big board, the all-time movie ranking list. We also have to give it a villain ranking, where we discuss whether we like the villain or not, and then we give it a breakfast food. So, what did you think of uh, Nolan Sorrento? I'll be honest, he's on the low yeah, end of my list. he's pretty list. low. I, yeah. don't, I don't know how your list looks, but we I don't can't either. imagine. He's not very high. That one we don't necessarily keep track of. It's more of just like a out of... Our, our scale is between uh, uh, Tommy Lee Jones as Tommy Two-Face Jones. in Batman Forever to Heath Ledger as the Joker in The Dark Knight. So he's somewhere between Batman villains. Yes, like that uh, is the, the top yeah. end, the bottom end of the scale. Okay, okay, okay. Because like, Two-Face keeps villain slipping ever the and coin in villain. Batman Forever. <laughs> he's definitely uh, closer to the to the Tommy Lee Jones then. Yeah, I, for, I mean, for sure. He's like, his motivation is clear, but it's like, Poor execution. it's stupid. Yeah. And Ben Mendelsohn, I think, acts it well enough, but I just think the writing of the character there. is really, really dumb. He yeah. was not as good as yeah. Krennic. Which is the last time we saw a villain by Ben Mendelsohn. Oh, Krennic is no. not a yeah, Krennic's not a good know. villain either. Oh, I like yeah, Krennic. He's such a no. Oh my gosh, Krennic is such a whiny baby. He goes to freaking Darth Vader's planet and be like, "Will you talk to the Emperor about giving me a promotion?" And Vader's like, "Uh, let me choke you real quick and remind you exactly what you just asked me and how stupid that was." <laughs> and Jay, don't choke on your ambitions, yeah. okay? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh my. God. Gosh, I thought Vader handled that situation perfectly. And I thought, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think Krennic was a very good villain. Anyway, I think that Nolan Sorrento is not quite as good as Krennic. He's in, like, the Abomination sort of class. I'll give him villain. I'll give him He's a just four out of ten. Evil for being villain. Okay. I can work four. Okay. That. Four sounds good. Okay, so uh, I'm going to... Yeah, board. we got to put it on the big board. Can you pick on the big board? Tell me what it's definitely worse than and what it's definitely better than, and then we'll okay. work it within so those confines. Okay, so it's definitely better than Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. I'll agree with that. And it's... Definitely worse than the Avengers. I'll agree with that as well. So do you want to start from top of that list or the so bottom there's of that a, there's list? There's like five movies in between there. Man, that's scary. <laughs> Which that's are Doctor list. Strange, Captain America, The First Avenger, Back to the Future Part 3, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, and Ant-Man. It's better than Back to the Future Part 3. I was I was going to say, oh. it's better than Back to the Future Part 3, but not quite as good as Captain America. Although, it sounds like on your... I would have put Ant-Man better than that too, but that's just me. Do you, I mean, do you want the full list, Jonathan? I don't. Okay. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's 27 movies on it. Interested. No. <laughs> yeah, it seems, it seems long and I'm going to lose track, so... Number one is can... Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and number 27 is Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. That sounds right. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's pretty wide margins on yeah. your end. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people, a lot of people well, have called into criticism our, our ranking of both The Winter Soldier and Ant-Man, but we, we take hard stances here. Okay, well, that's fine. It's, yeah. Hey, it's your list. It's your list. Yeah. I would say it's better than Back to the Future 3. I would agree with so. that. Okay. I can so I would put it that. in 13th of all time. Well, that puts it like sorry, literally right four, in the Yeah, 14th. it sounds like it's 14th. like dead middle, Yeah, basically. It would be the new 14. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I can work with that. Fair enough. That was easy. I knew it was going to be near Ant-Man. I was like, this was about as good as Ant-Man when I was watching I said the same thing. I don't know why. Yeah. Although Ant-Man, man, that's a good movie. There's Ant-Man, a lot of good movies that. on this list. <laughs> it ages well. Ant-Man? <laughs> Ant-Man does everything well, except for ants. <laughs> yeah. like ants it's going to be... Oh my gosh, what did we just watch? They're not as good as Scorpions. No, no, I didn't watch it. Yeah, they're, they're not as good as Scorpions, that... I'll tell you that. Have you watched that Santa Clarita diet show? No, not yet. Everyone has been talking about this show. Don't. I need I to hate watch it. You hate it? I absolutely hate it. I have been it. watching oh God, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events Season 2. I have to watch that with my girlfriend, yeah. and she's never around. So mm, That's a bummer. Yeah, she was gone all weekend, and I was like, you left me on Lemony Snicket weekend. Oh. <laughs> Did you watch Jessica Jones without her instead? No. Oh, I've been. I never got watch through season, season one of Jessica, one of Jessica Jones. Jones. You are kidding me! You guys review all it's... these Marvel movies and you haven't watched Jessica Jones? Correct. It's because it's bad. Uh, Jessica Jones is amazing. Ah, uh, uh, no. Uh, Daredevil was. Daredevil is great. great. Jessica Jones is great. Luke Cage is pretty good, and Iron Fist is unwatchable. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that from a lot of people. 
Oh my gosh. It's That's so how I bad. Felt about like all of them except uh, for anyway. Okay, so we got to give it a breakfast food real quick. Oh man. Jay, do you have any does any breakfast food come to mind for this film? I'll tell you what came to mind for me was a uh, was a was a was a homemade Belgian waffle with syrup, which is to say, I don't eat it very often, but I sure do enjoy it when I eat one. That's a good spot I on like that. review. I'm glad you didn't come in with some like avocado toast because I feel like you're just in the wrong generation for that. I am uh, a millennial, first of all, so I am not in the wrong generation. No, for but it. but 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 the eighties and the forties do not match the avocado toast foods. Oh. That's what oh, I'm saying. I mean, the people in the eighties would be so confused with avocado toast. And there's definitely <laughs> like no avocados, avocados in twenty forty five. There's definitely yeah, there's no avocados left. That's a luxury food and yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm I'm sticking with Belgian waffle. Belgian waffle. I like. Do you have any like coffee with that, or is it just? I have coffee with everything. <laughs> I remember when I asked Ben this question about uh, about Star Wars: The Last Jedi. He like, I was like, so Ben, you got a breakfast food for me? And he was just like, I've been thinking about this all day, and here's my answer. And I was just like, Oh God, you didn't have to. It wasn't that serious. <laughs> I can't. Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds like how Ben would answer that question. He would need to. He would need to think about well, it. Well, yeah, that. I texted him that morning. I was just like, "By the way, here's the, all the things we do," and he was like, "Got it." What? What did? Perf. What was his breakfast food for the Last Jedi? I can't even remember. Couldn't tell you. Oh my gosh, you got it. Okay, okay. Anyway, we've well, done a lot of I was movies on my with a lot of guests and a lot of breakfast foods. So, so his uh, preparation was memorable, but not his actual right, answer. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> well, they all start to blur together because there's only like five ingredients for breakfast. Right. There's flour. You got like some sort of dough that is cooked, and then you've got a meat, maybe there's eggs. So there many what meats. Movie? What are you guys' breakfast foods for this movie? Oh, we already went with yours, Belgian waffles. Oh, you you don't have to assign one yourself. No, we pick one for the show. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, the show picks the one. The show picks That's one. me. I don't know that I would have picked a Belgian waffle, but I'm not sure what I would But once you said it, it made sense. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm down with that. I do think I'll revisit this more often, and I do like the 80s a lot. So I feel like I spend a lot more time. Like you said you don't have this that often, but I feel like I will think of this more frequently than I think I'm going to get a text waffles. from Ty in about a week that's like, I'm listening to the book again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the movie. That's the book. Yeah, it's but he true. can't watch it's the book. I mean, I guess he could watch would, the movie again in a week. Would, would but starting Ego after like a month be more eighties, Tyler? Would that be better for you? Would, so you would Ego that? waffles be more eighties for you? Maybe like a bowl of Captain Crunch. Maybe like a bowl. I see Captain Crunch would have been that's that's a that's an Easter egg for the book. Ha! <laughs> see what you're going yeah. for. Um, see? Let's see. I'm, uh-huh. No, I'm sticking with my waffle. I hate that's the where fact that Will Wheaton says Captain in the oh, book. Yeah, Captain Crunch. I think I don't care how it's spelled. It is how it's spelled. It's not how it's said. Yeah. It's Captain, not not Cap'n. If it was, we, if it was, I don't know. It was pronounced like it was said, or it was pronounced like it was written. It'd be like Cap'n, not Cap'n. Yeah, Will Wheaton is big on the pronunciations whilst he is reading that book. I did love Will Wheaton's narration of that book, though. I actually have listened to Japan. To did I cover Japan? I've listened to Armada several times, even though it's awful, just because. Oh of Oh my Will god! Wheaton. I was gonna say first of all, you listened to Armada several times. Well, every time I uh, listen to Ready Player One, I'm like, I'm not done listening to Will Wheaton read me stuff, and I already have Armada, so I just listen uh, to it again. It's very short. It's, it's not, not good. Not very good. It's not it's very not good. good. Yeah, <laughs> it is just like. Hmm, I saved the world with 80s pop culture once before. Could I do it again? And I, <laughs> no, I mean... could Turns out I couldn't. It was a great concept, but horrible execution. Just horrible. Just terrible. It was just trying to Ender's Game it, and yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay, well, Jay, thanks for coming on. What's next for SCB? Oh my gosh! Well, we have our videos this week. We're doing a we're doing a, a meetup in June. We're gonna watch The Incredibles. Um, bacon and eggs. Is bacon gonna be and eggs there. will be there. That's gonna be exciting. Uh, what else is coming up? We're gonna, I think we're gonna be doing another Bacon and Eggs related, uh, some sort of film tournament, I believe. We're gonna be working yeah. with you guys on that. What is that. You know, do you know? It's Ben has been working on it a lot, and it seems like he makes progress every day, but then he encounters new problems every day, too. It turns out there's not <laughs> great online, like, available software to just, like, produce brackets that lots of people can fill out, so. Yeah, I figured that hard. out almost immediately when we were looking into this for our own purposes. I was like, yeah, this is yeah. gonna be a nightmare. Yeah, it's gonna, I mean, it's gonna be fun. I, somebody asked me to fill out that other bracket, and I had Wally win. Um, I refused to fill out that other bracket on principle because of how horrible the seating yeah, was. Yeah, it was awful. Why yeah. would you put Moana I and Frozen yeah, so against each other was, in the first round? Why would you put Wally yeah, my, and the Incredibles against each other in the first round? Yeah. 
I don't know. Where- right. My point was whoever wins Moana Frozen goes to the final, and whoever wins Incredibles Wally goes to the <laughs> final. And that was like, the rest of these don't matter. Right. Like, <laughs> That's a little bit how it gets to be going. I guess it's interesting to see what what the ma- what defeats what. So many people are like, Sometimes. Moana wins this, obviously. Mm, so our bracket. No, I, I don't know if you guys have seen the final choices that we've put on there. We spent most of Friday narrowing down, like doing the seating for them, which took a good long while. And yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun whenever we launch it. So if you, if it, maybe it's already launched by the time you're listening to this and maybe it hasn't, but uh, it'll be fun. <laughs> well, Jonathan, it's been, or Jay, I guess, I'm, I don't know what I'm supposed to call you. You can call me either one, eggs, either one. <laughs> I've known you since I was like 10. And Ethan, you can call me anytime. I- you always call me. I'll call you I Al, do. and he can be Jay. Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here. Thank you so much for dedicating your evening and, and coming out and talking Ready Player One with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on the show. It was fun discussing. I've been Ethan Edgehill, he's, and he's been Tyler Carlin, and he's been John Curlin. <laughs> yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's John Curlin, J-O-N-K-E-R-L-I-N. And as always, I am at Wow Now, but the O's are zeros. Tyler is at America Carlin, but it's America R-L-I-N. I don't know why I said but, but I just did. Our artwork is by Vaishan Brandon, and he's a pleasurable guy to work with. I love his artwork. He's done so well for us. And you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash bacon and eggs. You can also join our super secret Facebook group by kicking, clicking the link below because there's no good way to do a Facebook group. And I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Oh, uh, you did miss one thing. What did I miss? Scorpions. 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 Of course. Uh, our Twitter's at, at bacon and eggs 23. And until next week, Arrivederci. Anorax Almanac. Will you talk to the emperor about giving me a promotion? Scorpions.